Shalom, friends. Shalom, Havarim. Hesed v'shalom. And uh, I'm in this, uh, this will be kind of part two of what I said earlier on this page. I'm in the uh, Barn Dominium. And I thought I'd say just a little bit more about building. My wife pulled up earlier and, hey, guys, you know, when a beautiful woman pulls up and you're married to her, yeah. You quit everything, right? Okay, so anyway, 31 years this year, by the way. Um, I was uh, looking some stuff up in Talmud, I don't know, some time ago, months ago, weeks ago, years ago, I don't know what it was. Time becomes irrelevant to me, but, um, and, and Talmud, you know, I've, I've owned it for a decade or two, a couple of decades, I guess, and I don't read it, I look things up in it. Just, you know, I know some folks think I'm a Talmud student. I know. I love Talmud, don't get me wrong, but uh, I look things up and I, I, I wish I had time to read it. Anyway, um, what I was looking up was a fellow named Nicodemus. He's in there, you know. Nicodemus, Nicodemus was not his birth name. That was a given name. That was his nickname. Uh, Nick, Nicodemus comes from partly Greek, partly Hebrew. It basically means somebody who does things that are just magnificent, like lightning out of the sky kind of magnificent, you know, something that really, really catches your attention. He was one of, if not the richest man in Israel at the time. And he was a financer. He financed many, he financed great projects, basically. And that's where his name comes from. He finances things that are spectacular or helps people out in a financial spectacular way. He was wealthy and used his wealth in a good way towards the people. So he was called Nicodem, uh, Nicodemai, I think is the way you pronounce it, before it's Latinized. But his birth name, his actual name, was Bonne. Bonne means builder. And that's why I said I'd say something a little bit more about building. But Nicodemus, or Bonnet, was a builder, not, he built people in a uh, roundabout way, in a, in a, not in a direct way, because he built projects. He financed projects. And that kind of building is good, okay? If you want to build a large church or something, a church house, that is. Okay, remember what we said earlier. If you want to build a big church house or a big project like that or a small one or whatever, or you want to finance a school or something like that, those are good things. Those are good things. But when we talk about building in the Bible, we're talking about people. We're not talking about uh, structures at all. We compare people to trees, yes, and by the way, that's also in the New Testament. I was kind of in a hurry earlier because I saw my wife pulling up. But anyway, um, in the New Testament, you remember, it's in, uh, it's in Matityahu or Matthew. Matty is uh, talking about the time when Yeshua, when Jesus was, um, he was healing a blind man. And, and he asked the blind man, what do you see? And the blind man said, well, I see trees walking around. Well, that was not, oops, I made a mistake. That was not Jesus making a mistake. You know, oh, I, I didn't quite heal him. No, no. There, this, he could see something, right? So, yeah. So he was healed, but he touched him again, and he saw people as we see people. So, yes, it uh, wasn't a mistake. You sure didn't say, oh, doggone it, i got to try this magic trick again. No. It was simply that the first time the fellow looked, he saw People is how they're compared to in the Bible. So, yes, we build people just as trees are built. We grow. And that leads me into Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 1 talks about growth. I've, I, if there's anything I've talked about, I've talked about this. You can take me to my grave and I will probably be st still talking about growth, maturing, that is. And it gives actual steps. It's not a growth like, well, I guess I'm growing. No, it's actual steps that you can, you can look at and say, okay, I think I'm right here. I think I or this congregation or this group of people 
is in this particular area. And you may, you may adventure upon those areas again, maybe a few times in your life. But generally speaking, you can see yourself in those steps. And this is spoken of in First Peter, and then he says in the last chapter, or Second Peter, I believe, yeah, it's Second Peter. The last chapter he says grow, the very last verse says grow. I can't remember what the King James says, but it basically means grow. The, the Greek word means please keep, keep growing. In the middle chapter, no, he didn't write it in chapters, nobody did, but it came later. I understand that. But in the middle chapter, in the middle part of the letter, he talks about being willingly naive or willingly ignorant. That's what happens when you don't grow. That whole second chapter is a rant, essentially, toward this thing of not growing. He gives examples of what happens when you're not growing. You become willingly naive, and things happen. You you deny, you know, many things, and you're overtaken by many things, as Israel was when Israel was more naive, naive, ignorant, stuff like that, and. And uh, if you look at the translation of willingly ignorant, you'll find that it means something like blissfully naive. Isn't naivety great? You know, that that is bliss. Naivety is bliss because you don't have to be responsible for a great deal, right? But as you grow, growing is responsibility. Taking up responsibility. And you know the steps. Uh, virtue. Add to your faith. Now, once upon a time, that was... Martin Luther did not like that phrase at all, by the way. He put James... In fact, James was in his appendix. He did not put it in his actual uh, copying of the New Testament. And he had arguments with Second Peter, but nonetheless, add to your faith. It's called growing. Uh, faith without works is dead, right? Add to your faith virtue. The Greek word is aretes, which means man. It means manning up. It means becoming strong uh, you know strengthen yourself because you're going to grow you're going to begin being responsible and that takes some strengthening straighten your back and broaden your shoulders and take it on add to aretes add knowledge now mere knowledge puffs up but adding to your knowledge is in this case in this particular context is a part of growth many christians stop there the i've said this before on this particular venue that uh, the the uh, gematria uh, the, the gematria of the hebrew word for christian which is notsri uh, is the same gematria for the hebrew word for knowledge that is to say it's almost expected that Christians stop right there. That's why Paul says mere knowledge puffs up. He's talking to Christians. He wants them to grow beyond knowledge. And so we add to knowledge self-control. Self-control will appear within the gifts of the Spirit. That's where you're operating in your growth beyond your mere self. You can man up. You can add strength and broaden your shoulders and so forth. You can add knowledge but it is a cooperation with the Holy Spirit and being filled with Him wherein comes self-control. That is self-governance. That is being able to uh, control the good that comes out of you as well as the bad, knowing when it's appropriate. And that leads you into perseverance. In the Greek, or in the Hebrew, pardon me, that's savlanut. Similar in Greek, the, the words mean suffering through or being able to suffer well. And yes, suffering is part of life. It's part of everyday life. But this is growth in how to suffer. Uh, suffering is therefore, um, it is right. It is good. It is expected. It is something that you must do if you want to go into the next steps of growth. I'm speaking this as a person and as a congregation, or two persons and two congregations. Part of expected growth patterns that is good and healthy is suffering. Knowing how to suffer rightly as you suffer. Uh, that is part of growth. Look up the growth of Abraham. He goes through the same steps between Genesis chapter 
12 and 15 and Genesis 22. Next, if you learn how to suffer well and your, your learning in suffering is actually advantageous to you and to others around you, adding in self-control before that, then you will grow into Hasidut. This is godliness in most translations. It's because we don't know what to put there. The Greek word is asuvia. Asuvia, it's uh, a good piety. In, uh, in Hebrew, the only word that fits there is hasidut. It is the lifestyle of covenant grace or hesed in Hebrew. Now, hasidut in Orthodox Judaism is the way of Hasidic Orthodox Judaism. It covers every single detail of life. I am trying to bear this more onto believers in Messiah and say that Hasidut is the lifestyle of covenant marital grace with your God. It is when, well, okay, any, most any marriage, you go through a time of learning how to suffer together, learning how to grow through difficult times. And if you don't believe there will be difficult times, you are willingly naive. You you remember uh, Song of Solomon eight six I've drawn from many times love, and and this is in the case of marriage love is a, is fierce, marital love is fierce it's like as strong as death, but it is the flame of Yah. So you learn how to go through that and you come into this lifestyle of marital covenant grace where you're operating rightly within that. And that brings you into love of brothers and sisters in the Lord and agape love of God that you began with. You began with a touch of it, but now you could love Adolf Hitler. You could love Stalin. You could love Mao. Practically speaking, I'm not talking about feelings. Feelings are an outcome of things. They're not the thing itself. Okay, Remember Boston's song, More Than a Feeling? Well... That's because reality is more than a feeling. There are folks who have no feelings and yet they still operate, right? So, when I speak of love, agape love that is practical and strong, then I'm talking about God's love, the love of the Father. And I hope, I trust that this year we may experience the love of the Father. Experience the love of God, which is, it'll blow your mind. It's not what you expect. It's not a lack. It's not feelings. It's not how comfortable you are, how comfortable you're not. It's not convenience, America. It's very, very real, extraordinarily real. As you experience the glory of God, understand that the Hebrew word for glory is also the Hebrew word for weight, like heaviness, to be heavy. This is... Okay, C.S. Lewis put it this way. He is a lion that cannot be tamed. Cannot be tamed. Don't even try to go there. Just accept the love of God. Receive the love of the Father. That agape. And build. Finance things, yeah, that's great, but build people. Okay, I'll shut up now. Shalom, my friends.